Well, welcome to a G-Force interview. I'm so excited to be interviewing Dr. Billy Allsbrooks. This guy is an all-time favorite of mine. I would argue to say that he helped save my life. During the darkest times of my world, this man was one of the voices that helped rebuild me from the inside out. There's so much power in the motivation and in the, the truth that he shares that this has been just an amazing journey. Uh, and I read his book every single day. He is the author of Blessed and Unstoppable. He is a change agent committed to setting the world on fire with truth and empowering a billion people, which I know without a shadow of a doubt he will do in his lifetime. He is absolutely stricken with truth. And I'm so grateful that you share it with the world via YouTube, via speaking, via books, via social media. Uh, you, sir, are literally on fire. You put out a video every single week, no matter what, at least one. Uh, you make positive rap songs. Like you're, you're doing everything as a voice of truth, as a voice of hope. What are you seeing happening right now with this craziness of the coronavirus that is really rocking our world as we know it? The struggle is real, but so is the God that's going to help us overcome this thing. You know, the greater the trial and tribulation, the greater the destiny. So we just have to, you know, face it head on and, and stand our ground. We can't get caught up in all this fear and, and world panic and all this stuff. You know, fear is a track star. You can't outrun it. So just turn around and face it. Get in a ring with it. Let it know who's boss and, and do your thing. You know, God will take what the enemy meant for harm, this whole situation, and he can... He can thrust us higher through this situation and make us better through it. So we're just going to stay in faith and do us like we've always, you know, always been doing. So. You have got a powerful story and it talks, it really leads to your qualifications around helping people with mindset. I know you're, you're Dr. Billy Osbergs, but I would call you the doctor of mindset. What are some truths that people can hang on to during this, again, very unstable time? Well, we just have to have to realize we're not in this alone. You know, that's the thing. There's somebody greater behind us pulling these strings who's looking out for us. And um, if we try to do it in our own capacity, then then we all should run. We all should be scared. But realizing, you know, the nature of our maker, then, then we are in good hands. And he's going to he's gonna turn this thing into something, you know, uh, glorious for him. And there's so much that we're going to learn through this um, dark season that we would have never been able to learn any other way. So there's... There's so much opportunity out there right now, too, because the news is just broadcasting the bleak and the dark and, you know, doing what they do. But there's so much good out there right now. There's so much opportunity out there. This is probably the, the greatest time of our life of opportunity-wise. In whatever field you're in, there's so much opportunity, impact, to help, to strengthen, for business, what ministry, whatever it is. This is the time that we have all been waiting for. It's just how we frame this situation. You know, we can either, you know, frame it dark in a way that disempowers us, disables us, or we can frame it in a way that empowers us, launches us, strengthens us, organizes us, unifies us, consolidates us, whatever it is. And that's the way I'm trying to approach this whole situation. And, and that's kind of my message, too, is, you know, where's the, the opportunity and whatever it is that you're doing, look for it because it's all right there in front of you. Wow. What are some of the opportunities that you're seeing? What are the biggest opportunities that most people are, are missing? Well, like in, in my field in particular, um, usually during seasons of struggle, they come for the, you know, personal development. They come for the motivation. They come for the inspiration. So um, I think God has been preparing me and strengthening me for this exact moment and to have this base that I've been building over the last few years and to be in the right position at the right time. So now I'm here and he's been preparing me and strengthening me and now I can come in and do what he's assigned me to do with my mouth and so life over people. And that's the same in, the, you know, every field, every um business, whatever it is, there's opportunity there. Just you, you just have to block out the noise and get back to basics and say, okay, where can I be the most useful? How can I add the most value? Same thing always works no matter what. It all comes down to value. Whatever you're doing, it's about how can I help? How can I make the world better? How can I leave this place better than I found it? And um, just keeping that kind of mindset, bringing that mindset into this environment is key if you, if you want to be um, – empowered if you want to be used you, you got to have this kind of mindset what is uh again you're saying there's opportunity everywhere you know mm -hmm. i see how somebody who's in motivation 
Right. I, you know, I'm not going to lie. I've listened to a video every single day because I'm not an idiot and I know how to keep my mind right. You know, this is the right, time right. You, can't, you can't, if you read the news at all, which is a business owner, it's mm -hmm. annoying, but I, I have to, for the first time in my life, I'm actually kind, not even reading the news. I'm just glancing at the headlines every morning and I'm like, ugh. It can be so painful, but if I wasn't a motivational speaker, what are the everyday opportunities that you're seeing for that would apply to almost everybody? Um, for instance, you know, my wife um, is a realtor, so she's been selling real estate all the way up until this time, and it's kind of been um, aggressive bubble climbing in price. We've been looking to buy investment properties, but it's just kind of been overpriced, I thought. Now I'm like, okay, here it comes. This is the opportunity we've been waiting for. We've been preparing for this, and now it is here. Same thing in stock. Look, I mean, look how much the stock market got hit over the you know past few weeks. Sales that you could never get in a lifetime have just showed up on our doorstep, and you can basically just pick whatever you want to invest in. And there's an opportunity right now. So there's so much there. You know, if we just get out of the out of the news um, dark, you know, cycle that they're trying to put on us, and just stay focused. You know, I get scared. If I watch the news too long, I start getting that way. I'm like, hold on, I got to get myself, I got to gather myself. It's like, we, we have to read and, and be aware in these times, but we got to do selective reading, selective mm -hmm. research, because if you don't, that enemy will plant that seed in you. Um, and it, it could be destructive real easy if you don't protect your mind. Right now, we have to quarantine, not just our bodies. We got to quarantine our mind. That's the most important thing. Quarantine our mind. Yes, you're so right. Quarantine your mind. Interesting. That's right. What are you and the bigger suggest? the dreams, here's the thing, the bigger the dreams, and this is even before this crisis, the bigger the dream, the big, you know, the bigger the goal that you have, the more you must protect your thinking. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the world speaks two languages, local needs and global needs, right? The local people kind of stay in that 15 mile radius, they go to work, they go shopping, um, they just, you know, live their life within 15 mile radius, and that's as far as they think. Global needs is realizing that the whole world is open if, if you want it to be. If you have the right mind, the whole world is open now, connected with the internet and all the stuff that we have going on. So if you have big dreams, you're going to have to protect it from the local needs. It's like local needs and global needs speak in two different languages. Like if I go in and I'm, I'm speaking a global global dream I have to a local person, they're going to call me crazy. Like, I don't understand what you're saying. It's like we're speaking Chinese or something, you know? So you have to be very careful who you tell your dream to and then who you let you know, into your thinking and into your processes because all it takes is one or two negative thoughts introduced into an environment. It can cause a chain uh, reaction of doubt and fear and hesitation and things that are enemies of greatness. So you must protect your mind. The bigger the dream, the more you must protect your mind. You've been around a lot of successful people. You've been around a lot of people with big dreams and big visions. What's mm -hmm. the, what are the biggest things that hold people back? Um... Having to figure it all out first before you make that move. Like you got this big dream, you're like, well, how am I gonna get from A to Z tonight? You, you know, you're not gonna get from A to Z tonight. But what you gotta do is get from A to B. So what I what I tell people that have the big dreams, the bigger the dream, the more you must break it down into small manageable pieces. Right? You have to say, okay, own today. I'm gonna dominate my space today. I'm gonna do everything I can do. I'm gonna get every ounce. Out of these 86,400 seconds today, I'm going to get every ounce out of them and hold every single second accountable to my dream and what I'm trying to accomplish. Wow. So if you break down the big into the small, then the, what the world calls impossible becomes possible if we take it one day at a time. If, if you read the, the book there, that first page in the book, I learned this the hard way, but that, that first um, quote in that book is success is a marathon of consistency walked mm. out one day at a time. So success is just stringing a lot of whole lot of the days together that you have mastered. You master each day. And if you string enough of them together, the world calls it success because it begins to manifest on the, on the outside. So the main thing in situations like this, we don't control so much of what's happening on the outside. So we have to ask the right questions because questions will take you wherever you want to go in life. You just got to ask the right question. So mm -hmm. you come back to yourself and say, right now, what do I control? You know, I don't control, like I got this 40 city tour going on, right? So this is obviously kind of, is annoying this stuff that's going on. <laughs> I don't control whether the, I don't control yeah. whether the airlines are running or what city or cities or yeah. states are on quarantine locked. I don't control anything. So I have to get back and say, okay, what does Billy control? What does God want me to focus on right now? Where do I put my time, energy, and resources? And when I get up from the moment I get up to the moment I go to sleep, I stay in that lane, I stay in that place that I actually control and keep my mind on those things. 
the, the, the quarantine thing will work itself out. The airlines running, that'll work itself out. But I've got to do what I've got to do that I have control of. And if I do that, then the rest of it will take care of itself. So That's so true. It's so true. It's just taking those small steps. Okay, my, my thing and something God showed me is opportunity never goes away. It just switches right. places. So in the greatest recessions and depressions of our lifetimes are the greatest disruptions for complete yes. new change. And, you know, we all yes. saw Uber and Lyft and mm -hmm. Airbnb and all these huge disrupting companies that changed life as we know it came from 2008 through 2010. Right. So, so what's going to be the next one? Right. That's I'm what really we got to figure out. What are the next ones? What's working now? What are the trends? What's what's almost unstoppable, but what's going to continue? You know, you don't want to just, it'll only work right. because everybody's stuck in their houses. What will continue to work afterwards? You know, there's some companies, Amazon's hiring 100,000 people. What else is working? How can I shift my business and adapt to this new normal for a little while? But there will be habits formed during this time that won't end. You know, there, there will be people, I, I know, I heard one today that wine and beer are now on delivery in Nashville oh, yeah. and that yeah, was never definitely. allowed before. So yeah. now that that's there, that probably won't stop. I'm not saying yeah, that's that not business. Stop. I'm saying, what, what is something new that we're seeing that we weren't seeing before that will continue after this and how can we invest according to our values and continue to expand those, those new needs? So it's awesome. That was great. I want you to share your story though. I think it's so powerful. And well, let, let me build off two you, things you just said there first before we go into that. You know, every trial and tribulation or challenge or circumstance has a mindset required to overcome it. You just have to say, what is the mindset required to overcome this situation? Where do I need to place my mind so that I'll be in position to win? When this thing comes, when the world comes back online and opens up, we want to be running full speed, not trying to figure it out then. We want to already have this plan together. We want to have that vision together, and we need to be going full speed. And see, opportunity has a mindset required to see. Mm. So, they, you know, you have, you have to put your mindset in a place that you can see it. So what is, right there. What is, your, what is your mindset required for what it is that you do to put yourself in that position so that when you come out of this, you're actually stronger than you were before you went into it? That is so good. I'm feeling so challenged right now. I've got a, I've got a group called GeForce that I started. It's a mastermind, and it was it started from my frustration, and it started from most everything I've started has started from my frustration. It's a gift, I say. It's a gift, you know. It's not just. It's not my fault. Not and uh, it's the frustration that when I was young and starting my business. I was very careful. One thing I knew I got right is I didn't have a lot of support either growing up or in school or anything. Um, I learned that you'd almost have to Noah's Ark this ish, which is mm -hmm. only listen to God's voice or very, very few voices right. um, to be able to speak into what you're doing. And you can only listen to those you want to be like. That was like my one mm -hmm. rule. Okay. I'm only going to listen to people you want to be like. And in that very specific area, but even when I found people in business, that were successful and doing great. They would always come to me and say, Brittany, I'm successful in this real estate, whatever, or this business or this business. You are not going to make it if you care about people and the planet the way that you do. You're just, you can't be financially successful and have the impact that you want. And so GeForce is a response to that. And I'm so excited mm -hmm. that you are one of our newer members because the point is to have other people who have dedicated their life, businesses, and resources to being a force for good in the world. And right. I wanted to ask you, in your experience, what have you seen as the most powerful part, or does it even really matter who your network is to be able to make it through? I've had it both ways. You know, um, now I'm, I'm getting around more um, of the type of people that I have strived my whole life to get around. But there was a time when I was completely alone. You know, but in that alone time, I found the power that I could have only found in an alone time, being alone, you know. Ooh. So sometimes they're, they're both can be a blessing. You just have to figure out what season you're in. You know, sometimes um, if you haven't found yourself, it's kind of limited to what other people can 
so into you because first you've got to find that piece, you know. Uh, once you find that piece, then you can start getting with people, and like you said, in, in different niches that you're trying to be like or areas that you're trying to grow and do, then you, you can have people come in and sew. But I've had both sides of it because the first half of my life, I was in the music business and I was doing the whole um, gang thug life, all of that in, in that world, the Hollywood lifestyle, chasing, you know, the wild women, the cars, the money, the fame, the houses, that all of that, what the world calls success. You know, not worrying about anyone else, you know, not not um social capitalism, more just like selfish feed me, feed me. It's all about me, me, me. You know, how can I get on? How can I get bigger? How can I get more successful, more money, whatever? Um, and I spent my first um, 17 years in the music business and it was all it was that mindset. That's what I brought into the, you know, the whole situation. Um, but luckily, God intervened, you know. See, when I was in that business, no matter how how much I got or how much success I achieved, the hole on the inside just kept getting bigger. You know, I always said, if I got one more song on the radio, I have my own radio show, I produce for Multi Golden Platinum Max. And I was like, if I just got one more song on the radio, if I just produce for one more hit act, then I would be happy and then I would, you know, be whole and whatever it is, that illusion, you know, that if you get something externally, then something on the inside is gonna change, right? Mm -hmm. So I pursued this aggressively. I did what the world said to do. Um, you know, is what they define as success, the world. And I chased it hard for 17 years, but wow. on the inside, I just kept getting more and more empty. Like, there's gotta be more, there's gotta be more, there's gotta be more. You know, my circle, my entourage, as we call it, got bigger and bigger and bigger. But my true friends got less and less and less. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's wanting to come there um, to be around me for the club at night. Can I get in VIP? Can I come in the limo? Can I do all, you know, they wanted that whole lifestyle, you know? So, um, but the real friends, the, the true friends were far a few between. But um, God intervened in 2007. Um, my father passed away in front of me, unexpected, had a, had a stroke. 12 days later, he had a um, blood clot on a Sunday. I went in to, to see him. He was doing better, supposedly about to get um, on the right track again. And then all of a sudden, boom, he's gone 10 minutes later. So this all happened unexpected to me and just rocked, you know, my mind, my mindset. I'm like, I didn't expect my dad to be um, in this situation, didn't expect him to be gone. He was in what I thought great health. He was 63, but looked 53. And my grandparents were in the 80s. So I'm thinking, okay, he's, he's going to um, be here for another 20, 25 years. But that wasn't the case. So um, God began to work on me and prepare me for what I'm doing now. Through the darkest hour, through my worst time, is the time that he showed up and showed out and came in and prepared me. And when I look back now, I see it. But at the time, it just looked like dark, you know, just complete chaos, um, complete alone. Even though there's people, there were people around me, family around me, but I, on the inside, I was just completely um, alone. And the way he died in front of me caused um, mm -hmm. panic attacks and PTSD. So I had that for the next seven years. That's my whole life. I went from being on stage in front of 20,000 people with, with a microphone in my hand to being in a room two weeks at a time in my master bedroom because I was scared to come out because I was going to have a panic attack. I went to the hospital 12 times in, in nine months, you know, rushing, thinking I was going to die every time something twitched on my body. I'm like, I want to have a stroke like my dad. And boom, I'd go to the emergency room. And um, so all this stuff, like we're going now, the quarantine, for two weeks, I did this for seven years. So I'm, it's like, oh, I'm like, I'm like, yo, welcome to my world. This is what I was telling y'all for seven years. So um, the, the fear of dying, <laughs> I had it every second of the day because fear cannot be compartmentalized. Once it's in a an environment, it will seek to spread if you do not check it. Mm. And the, the enemy had my mind. He knew God's destiny for my life. So he knew he had to get me there. If he didn't get me there, then he, he didn't stay in the shot. So he was really, really putting his, you know, attack on me and I was really having to, to dig deep. And um, so many things that happened during that time um, prepared me for this, you know. The way God started working on me, I, the, the first thing that happened, I went to the funeral home two days after my father died. Funeral director comes out and it's me and my grand, um, grandmother sitting there. And he said, let me take you out to your, your dad's um, plot. Your grandmother had bought Four plots, um, one for the, my grandfather, who was like 85 and just passed, one for her, she was still living, one for him, and then one for me. So we get out wow. there. He's like, I want to show you where the plots are, right? So we get out there, and he's like, there's your grandfather. There's where your grandmother's going to be. 
here's where your dad's gonna be, and here's where you gonna be. Now, you know, That's in horrible. the rap life, that, in the rap life that I came from, you know, I, I've been to 20, 25 funerals. I've seen people shot, killed, all that, but it never registered. Like I'm gonna die. You always think like, oh, that that's bad. It happened to so and so, but you don't think it's gonna happen to you. We had this like Superman mentality. So when I'm over there and he's explaining this and he says, this is where you're gonna lay. Here's where you're gonna lay. It really made sense because I saw my dad literally take his last breath the last 10 minutes. I saw him struggle. I saw like the doctors not being able to do anything because he had a blood clot and there's nothing you can do. I saw literally him struggle, suffer, gasp, all of that. And I'm just like, like when he said, this is where you're going to lay, I knew what that meant. You know, I seen the stillness. I seen the transition. So I couldn't run from it anymore. Ah. Right? So we go from out there at, by the plots back into the funeral home. The second lesson God shows me, the funeral director says, okay, what do you want on your dad's headstone? What do you want in the obituary? What do you want it to say? Now, mm. I'm still out there at the plot. Here's where you're going to lay, right? My mind is still out there, right? So when he's asking about the headstone and the obituary, I'm like, okay, one day they're going to be saying this about me. What do you want on Billy's headstone? Yeah. What do you want on, on, on Billy's obituary? Now, my mind started processing, like, if I died right now, what would be on that? Yeah. You know, here, here lies a man that served himself, ran over whoever, had to run over to get on, to get, you know, to get success or whatever. Didn't do anything for anyone else, didn't care about anything else. It was all about him. And wow. I was like, that's not the story that I want. That's not the last chapter that I want. Wake really. up. Right, right. And I was like, if my mother read that story, wow, I'd be embarrassed. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I didn't really live up to what, you know, her expectations was in my life. And then um, two days after that, we went to my dad's wake and growing up, see, my dad was an alcoholic, right? Um, he struggled, struggled, struggled with drinking. He was a good man. He wasn't violent or, or things like that when he drank, but he had this vice, this addiction that he could not break. No matter what he did, he just could not shake it. He, you know, two weeks, two weeks, two months, he'd be sober. He'd take one drop. He drank one drop. It was the next two weeks. He was gone literally mentally. He would drink until he passed out stay in this state he would get up continue drinking for two weeks and just could not stop the only way he would stop is we would hide the keys hide the money and he couldn't get it you know anything to drink that's it and he literally going to these shakes and detoxing all that like with the body just completely oh. um, addicted and um he did this over and over from about the time i was nine until um, my senior year and finally my mother didn't know what to do he'd been to rehab and all this stuff and we just couldn't figure it out so finally she divorced him my senior year going into my senior year but from that point on when he got the paperwork he never drank again not one drop did he drink once he got the paperwork he never drank again he was oh. trying to get his family back right so i'm here at this wake he'd been sober 15 years before he passed away and they got his body laid out and the people come up and they start talking about my dad so here's the next lesson god is showing me god comes up and he's like your dad came and got me on the side of the road at 2.30 in the morning when I was drunk and no one would come get me. You know, I had a DUI already and, and it could have been really, really bad, but your dad came and got me. Another one said, your dad came and bailed me out of jail at 4.30 when everybody else, my family included, gave up on me. Your daddy didn't give up on me, kept sowing life into me. He came and got me and got me right. Another one said, uh, my wife and, and me were at the divorce table with the paperwork and everything about to sign and your daddy said, don't do it. We didn't do it, went to counseling, and 10 years later, we're still together. You know, this is the kind of stuff they were seeing at the wake. Now, I never heard this. My dad never bragged or mentioned or anything like that. He kind of the anonymous, you know, alcoholic anonymous. So he never mentioned any of this kind of stuff. But the thing that got me was all the stuff I've been chasing in life, nobody was talking about. Nobody was up there like, your daddy's got good rims. You know, boy, you should have seen your daddy's car. Or he had a nice chain. Or did you see yeah. his dad's Rolex? Nobody was talking about any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, like, everything that I've been putting all my time, energy, effort, and thought it was just the world, nobody mentioned it the way. Mm -hmm. So I realized, you know, the only, the only thing here they're talking about is the impact that he made on their life, what he sold into other people. So I realized the real network that we have is all that we sow into others in that city. Yeah. You know, I'm not against the, you know, um, success, the cause and all that. I'm not against it. And God's not against you owning those things. He's against those things owning us, right? 
So that's what I learned on that lesson. I'm like, you know, I've got this all wrong. It's been all about Billy up until this point and not about anyone else. So God began to work on me. And I, I said right there at that point, I was like, this is enough. I'm going to make a difference. When I go out, I want to have something different on that, that headstone, something different in that obituary. Wow. So I got up and, and began to pursue that. But now I had this issue. Because, you know, anytime you, you make a decision and, and, and you're starting to move toward God's calling, mm-hmm. there's going to be a war. There's going to be a struggle. There's going to be tribulations and trials and testing and pruning. and Testing. Did and, you mean it? Did you really care? Right. Did you really mean it, right? So now I've got this, I've got this panic attack from the point um, that I found out my daddy had, you know, died right there. I had the first panic attack when the doctor finally confirmed what I'd already seen in the other room. Um, when he said, you know, your dad is gone, I had my first panic attack right there. I fell on the floor in the hospital thinking I was going to die. And from that point on, for the next seven years, that was it. You know, I had a lot of money put up from the music business and and. Um, stuff like that to survive. And I had businesses going on that I necessarily didn't have to be there, but all of that stuff suffered because I couldn't, you know, pour myself into it. I couldn't go do the club gigs, the producing, the songwriting, because I just wasn't in that that state. Yeah. And the more I had, the more the panic attacks I had, the more I feared having them. So I began to live in this complete yeah. closed like a box. tornado of anxiety. Right. And yeah. every single day, my money got less and less, you know, because you're getting squeezed financially, like you're not working or whatever, right? So I watched seven years. For seven years, I watched my money do just like this every single. It's like a death by a thousand cuts every day. It wasn't like a all chaos. It was just like one more cut, one more cut. And I was just like, when is this ever gonna stop? You know, for years, I prayed. For years, I I did every single thing I knew how to do to overcome it. I went to therapists, six, seven therapists. I went to medication. I went to grief share. I went to support groups. I went to church. I got baptized. I went to men's group. Like everything I did, nothing worked. And finally, one night, like this is like five, six years in, I come to God um, at the end of me. Mm-hmm. And I say, you know what? I, I, you know, up until my daddy passed away, I hadn't really had a relationship from the time I was 13, 14. My mother and them kept me in, in school, you know, Bible school and coming to church. About 13, 14, they gave me the own, you know, my own decision whether I went or not, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and the people I was looking up to do in high school, middle school, they weren't, they weren't going to church. So I didn't think that was cool. So, you know, they were gang members and stuff like that I was looking up to, so they weren't in church. So I just drifted away. But my mother and father had planted the right seeds in me. You know, train up a child in the way she go. When he goes old, he will not depart from it. They had put those seeds in me. So I came back to what they had planted into me. And I, and I said, you know, Lord, I know about you. I don't have a relationship with you, but I know about you. My mom you know, and dad told me about you. And I believe in you. Even when I was doing the dirt in that world, in that lifestyle, I still believed in God. I carried a Bible with me every day. But I was cussing. I was destroying with my mouth, you know, hmm. with, with my gift being my mouth that God had, you know, the, the gift God gave me was my mouth, my speaking, right? Well, mm-hmm. the devil knows that's your gift too. Mm-hmm. So he's fighting for that same gift, that same power. So for the first 17 years in the music business, he was using that for destruction. But mm-hmm. now God is using my mouth for construction instead of destruction, Ooh. right? We're building the kingdom, building up people, right? Yeah. But um, I come to God that night and I'm like, I don't have anything else to give you. The money's gone. There's, there's no friends here. Like literally... I called uh, AT&T one time and I said, hey, there's something wrong with my phone during this, this crisis stuff I was going through. And they checked my phone and like, ah, everything looks good on there. Why do you think something's wrong with your phone? And I'm like, well, I had rang in two weeks. Like all my friends, all the VIP, all those people that used to come for the club, oh, gone. Oh, man. So I was literally just, just me. <laughs> it is. I mean, that's where I was at. I was like had that rude awakening, like, hold on, okay, now you see what really has been going on mm. like this whole time. You've been blinded by what you, or you was ignoring it or putting it under the, you know, putting it under the mat, kicking the can down the road, did not have to deal with it. But I'm out there in front of God and I'm like, I got nothing. I got nobody. It's just me. I'll cut a deal with you. I got to the point, I just cut a deal with God. I said, I've tried everything I know how to do. I cut a deal with him. I said, if you heal me, <laughs> Look, yeah, I made it simple. I said, if you heal me, because I hadn't been able to do it, and I don't know who everyone else is giving up and all this, and I, I'm thinking at this point in time, this is going to be the rest of my life. Because right. it's, it's been six years, and 
I forgot what it was like before that. Like it'd been so long, I'd forgot there was an, another life where I didn't have to deal with this, right? Well, some people are thinking so, that after being quarantined for 14 days, there's uh, no other life but this now, let alone seven years. Right, you're right. That's why I say on some of the videos, if you hear them now, I say I was strategically designed for the wow. struggle. I'm yeah. strategically designed for that. All believers are in some kind of way. We're designed for this, you know, to overcome. But I'm out there on the block and I pray one night. I'm like, I've got nothing else to give you. I cut a deal with you. If you heal me, mm. I will go out in the world and tell them who did. That's all I got to offer you. And that is exactly what he needed, the invitation. I had to, we have to invite God in. Like he's always available. We have to invite him into the situation. And my desperation was that invitation. Come on in. I need wow. help. Right? And he honored that. And yeah. the thing is, it didn't happen overnight. See, people think, okay, well, you know. Yeah. You, you, it's like, I just got, no. I still had to go through the struggle. Yeah, yeah. But now, but now it became a little easier because I wasn't just doing it with me. Mm. Each day I got just a little bit better. A little bit better. Not, not a lot. Just a little bit. Two years went by, three years now I'm back, you know, back healthy again and back to start over and to start working on that legacy and that headstone that I wanted to to to, to rewrite. So then I got my, my my strength back. And then I'm like, okay, once I got to that point, I'm like, okay, God, now put me in, coach. You brought me out of this, put me in position, right? Because I wasn't doing any of this. I wasn't doing writing books before. I wasn't um, motivational speaking or teaching or anything like that. I was just doing this other lifestyle. Hmm. So um, God began to put me in position so that I could tell people that God still moves. So when, when crisis like this comes on, I get bolder because I'm like, oh, I know this. This is what I grew up on. I mean, this is what I had to go through. So, right. So I know that running like I used to do when I'd run to the hospital every, you know, 12 times in nine months, that doesn't fix this situation that we're going through. Faith fixes it. The moment I stopped running, when that fear thing came in my mind, when the enemy would start talking, this is going to be the end of your life. This is, the, this is all your days are going to be. And um, this is my world now. You know, when I started talking back to him instead of running from him, when I started saying, you know, like, that's not the plan God has for me. You know? So once I started talking back to the enemy, my, my situation began to, you know, began to change. But you have to, you have to stand your ground. One story mm -hmm. that uh, really affected me. Um, that I could tell, um, I having a panic attack almost constantly, three, four times a day, and I would call my mother. She was like one of the only ones that would really, you know, sit there and, and walk me through it and, and kind of hold my hand through this thing. You call mom, right? Uh -huh. So I call her one day and she's like, you know what, son, you grew up doing martial arts for years. Uh, when I was growing up, that's something me and my dad did together. I was state champion. Um, national champion, junior Olympics, all of that, and martial arts. So that was part of the training, which I'm doing now. But she said, you need to get back to that. You need to go get a punching bag, put it up in the backyard, and just hit that. Get this anger, this guilt, because I had a lot of guilt about my dad dying. Because the day he died, me and a nurse had moved him out of the bed. The doctor came in one day and said, you know, your dad's getting better. We got to get him out of the bed now, get him in the wheelchair, get him to start moving. We got to get him to get, you know, his strength back. So on the Sunday, I come in there, they say that. Me and the nurse grab my father, put him in the wheelchair to roll him out so he can start doing um, therapy. Um, but what we didn't know, there was a blood clot in his leg. So when we no. moved him, that's what <laughs> triggered, like it broke, the, the blood clot broke, went straight to his lungs, and he died 10 minutes later. So I, I held this guilt on myself. Like, you, you know, if you just hadn't moved him, if you hadn't been in a hurry, if you hadn't been trying to do it on your own, strength because I was trying to get him better like I was I felt like it was my responsibility yeah. I got to get him back right and I held that guilt you know for years and and it just wouldn't go anywhere it's just sitting there just all day talking to me you killed your dad you killed your dad you're not worthy you killed your dad right so my mother said you need to go out and hit that punching bag you need to get this stuff out so I went and got a punching bag like she said I went out there put the gloves on and I hit it two times and I had a panic attack so I run back inside, about to go to the hospital. I call her on the phone and I'm like, I'm about to go to the hospital, mom, I'm having a panic attack, I'm about to have a heart attack, blah, blah, blah. At this point, she knew what it was because I'd been having them for years now. She knew I wasn't dying, right? She knew it was just panic attack. So she said, she yelled at me. She said, Billy, to get my attention, right? Billy. And I'm like, yes, mom. She's like, go outside right now and hit that bag. 
And I'm like, you don't understand, mom. I'm having a heart attack. I'm about to go 911 right now. So I'm trying to tell all the reasons why I can't. She's like, you go outside right now and hit that bag. She's like, you can go out and hit it. Then you can go to the emergency room. But you need to go out there right now and hit that bag. I'm going to stay on the phone with you until you hit that bag. And she kept persisting, and I kept arguing with her, like, you don't understand, Mom, I'm dying, and I'm dizzy, the room is spinning, and, like, Aww. she's like, I do not care what it is, but you go outside, son, and you hit that bag, and then you go to the emergency room. So I'm like, I'm arguing with her all the way out there, but I'm, I'm obeying this, Mom. So I go out there to the bag, and I'm, I said, I'm out here, Mom, and she's like, hit the bag. So, you know, I hit the bag one time, and she said, hit again. So I hit it again. She said, hit it again, hit it again, and then I put the phone out, and I started hitting it myself. And then I grabbed the phone and I said, I'll call you back, mom. And I started hitting that bag. See, that was the first time that I actually stood up to fear and didn't just bail. You know, and I beat that bag probably for an hour until my knuckles were all bloody. Because I had so much in me that needed to be, you know, um, channeled in some kind of positive way. And I'm hitting to that bag and I'm like, you give me my life back. You know, everything you wow. stole from me. And I'm talking to the enemy as I'm hitting this bag for the first time, this is like the first time I stood my ground and did not run. Now, I still had those struggles from there, but I knew how to fight now. I was like, that was the first time I ever beat one of those bags. The first yeah. time that I won, that felt like I won that one. You know what I mean? Like, you know, for I years one. I've been losing. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like 0 and 100, right? Or 0 and 200, whatever, <laughs> yeah. I've been defeated. And this is the first time I won a game. I was like, wow, like we, we actually won this one. So like it gave me that confidence and, and God began to strengthen me and, and show me like, you cannot run. This is what I'm saying. Like in this situation, we don't back down. We got to plant our feet and be like, okay, I, I understand the fears and the dangers and all that, but we don't run. They call us believers because we actually believe we're not going to run. You know, it's not really believing when everything is good, right? It, it, the, the faith is tested in the fire. The more we go through the fire, more, the more refined we become. So like I learned all these lessons you know, in the midst of war and, and uh, total chaos on the inside. So, like, when all this stuff is going on, I'm just like, man, this is, this is the way I lived for years. You know, yeah. not two weeks, not 14 days quarantine. I, I spent seven years quarantine. You know, people didn't even recognize me when I came out. Like, you know, like, where have you been? Like, I thought you were gone in seven years, you know? I can't think of somebody more qualified. My gosh, your story is just you know, you have so much insight and I do want to hear your, uh, your quick and dirty advice on, on how to deal with being quarantined, how to overcome that. But literally, I know that there's a diverse audience watching this, but we yeah. don't have a story if we can't talk about God. I'm sorry. You listen to mm -hmm. our interview. This is all we have. I do. Yeah. I can't talk about it without talking about it. I really have nothing. Right. So there is nobody more qualified. And what's beautiful about your story and what I gained from it, I mean, a million things, but you don't understand why you have been allowed to go through why, what you're going through sometimes. And if you truly believe that God works everything out for good for those who love mm -hmm. him, those who are called according to his purposes, right. you have to claim that right now. I've got so many things I call it. I'm recalculating. I don't have any of my businesses going under, thank God, or anything like that. But they, they of course could, if I wasn't navigating through them, if I wasn't mm -hmm. looking for the opportunity, if I wasn't in there and just being flexible and saying, I don't care what you say. We have new innovations. Like right. there is right. a seed of equal or greater opportunity in this right. and we're going to find it. But what I want to, I guess, remind people of, including myself is that you may be allowed to go through something for seven years, but mm -hmm. what you've overcome, Billy and I, I'm personally, I'm telling you, you're a huge part of saving my life. I've personally been so blessed by the work that you have put out and the hope that you've shared and the motivation and the amount of people that have been changed and the good that has been orchestrated through my life still being here is going to be a generational blessing to you because you didn't choose to quit. You overcame, you turned, and then you shared. A lot of people, they'll overcome something or they'll be mad at God. You wasted seven years of my life. It mm -hmm. took seven years to be able to carry the truth that you have, right. that you share with other people. If you haven't listened to Billy, guys, look him up. He's absolutely incredible. And that's why he is being interviewed right now, because this is a time of great testing. But I want to encourage you that you don't have to know why right now. We don't have to know why, but you do have to look through the filter of saying, someday I'll know. And what I'm learning right now will qualify me 
and give me the authority to influence all the people that I've always wanted to will actually answer the prayer that I've been asking God for years. But it is how you step up, not step out. My gosh. Oh, and you know, what's crazy is that eulogy is what changed my life. So you had the in-person experience of seeing the story of your dad and, and recognizing right then, if you died right then, everything you'd been pursuing was for not. I had the same experience at 17. I wasn't a rapper or anything like that. I was 17, <laughs> but I was just goofing off and I really wanted to serve God at a really big level, but I wasn't doing anything to make the statements true that I had written down. This is what I want my story to be, but I'm not doing anything to make those statements true. And at 17 years old, I had a huge shift. That's when I woke up. Sounds like that's the moment you woke up and, and right, right. people say it's morbid to write your eulogy. I don't care if it's mm -hmm. morbid. It is how you can, it's really how you can understand what matters most. It's the greatest filter of saying, does the watch matter? Or right. does picking the guy up off the side of the road, believing right. in them, interrupting, like blessing people, like what really freaking matters? And it's the biggest wake up call. And it, I think it, for me, and what I've seen it do is it takes away all the shoulds. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. You should, no, what really matters? to me in my one chance on earth. Yeah, we only get one shot at this. One shot. You know? And the enemy's asking this question every day. The spiritual enemy's asking every single day, what does it take to break you? Ooh. If I give them cancer, if I yeah. get them fired at work, if I rob them of a promotion, if I get the marriage divorced, if I have mm -hmm. them take, off the, take the kids off somewhere or whatever it is, whatever, whatever it is that, um, your weekend, whatever area, the enemy is going to attack that and test you in that place. And in this moment here, it's just like every other um, time in life, it's all about the response. How are we going to respond to this? It's not about that, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the virus is spreading, but what is our response to it? How are we going to act? Are we going to slow down? Are we going to be timid? Are we going to disconnect from the world? Are we going to be more aggressive and more bold than ever? So it really comes down to that. What is our response going to be? You know, when, when you have the medical, the bad medical uh, news, how are you going to respond? Are you just going to lay down? Or are you going to keep on fighting? You know, I, I'm very eminent about not calling somebody a champion until they first been beat. Right. Because I think anybody can do it as long as they're front running. Everything is good. It's when you get blindsided. And, yes. you know, knocked on the ground and everybody's saying it's over with and you don't have any strength left in you that you feel and you, you feel like you've come to the end of you. And, and then we find out your real identity, who you are. You know, mm -hmm. then you show to the world, you reveal your true identity. And, and you the reveal your back up. Yeah, our, yeah those exactly. greatest knockouts, like complete knockouts of my life. I'm so, <laughs> I look back, I'm like, I'm really proud of you because I, I saw what I cared about. I saw what I responded with. One of my first big knockouts, I was working like 18 to 21 hours a day. And I had a contractor, it was through the whole recession, all this stuff. And I had a contractor steal a million dollars and lie to me about building orphanages in Haiti and all this stuff. Like just the whole con artist situation, stole a million dollars. And then said he was coming after me to sue me just to cover his tracks. And I didn't have a million dollars to steal. And I, I wanted to curl up in a corner and just die. I was so stressed. Mm. And I owed people money. And I didn't know how I was going to finish the projects. And all the subs hadn't been paid in three months. And I'm not a contractor. I don't know how to finish these jobs. Oh but I put my boots on. And I thought to myself, well, you've lived in your car before. You can handle <laughs> it in your car, but you will do whatever it takes. Like we're going to go get up and do whatever it takes to pay these people back and make sure these investors get their money back. And That's right. five months later, well, I did it. Well, I did it. Thank God I did it. I mean, it, I worked so much. I paid all the subs, fixed everything, pay, you know, it took a little bit longer, but I paid all my investors back. And I thought they'd never invest with me again. Like game over. But what they did is they went and told all their friends, no matter what happens to mm -hmm. Brittany, she'll pay you She's back. Like She's coming she through. Yeah, she's not gonna give up. In that race, but she'll pay you back. And five months exactly. later, the company was five times bigger because Amen. of the right thing. But I didn't know that would be what happened. But it took getting knocked the freak out 
for me to understand mm-hmm. what's really in my heart. Because you always hope you'd make decisions like that. Mm-hmm. But it is those moments that really do reveal. And those are the kind of people you want around you. You want a team. You were asking earlier about what kind of team you want. You want a team that's going to fight when things get rough, that they don't run the first time things, you know, don't go that go your way. You know, you need some fighters in the trenches, you know, and, and you need unfortunately, your mom. We need your mom. Right. You, that's where my you mom is. Some, exactly. You get up. Exactly. You get back up. You're right. I've got like an entire force around me now that this is my friend group. My friend group are people that are willing to kick my butt into stepping up and following my calling and won't let me believe the lies that I'm telling myself when I'm down. That's right. my circle. That's what G-Force is too. That's like the point. You're not you see, allowed to quit on your calling. You, you want to ask the question right now, like if the war was to jump off, you know, the spiritual battle, whatever it is, the sickness or the business trouble, who do I want to go into war with? Like who do I want on my team? You know, you want to look around and say, okay, I, do I have the team or do I need to add other pieces? What pieces are, am I missing for that kind of situation? Because, you know, we have to prepare for the unknown. We have to, you know, the unexpected. It, that is the, the 9-11. We wake up one day in 9-11. We have to prepare for those kind of moments like this virus. Nobody really saw it coming. We didn't, no. we didn't prepare for this. So you've got to have a team in place that will help you overcome whatever life is going to throw at you. You know, this is a great time with all this downtime that we're quarantined off and we've got some great thinking time, you know, where we, we don't have anything else to do but think now. So let's let's build, um, you know, ourselves up and put ourselves in position when we come on this to be stronger than ever. Make sure some people out there are listening right now, somebody needs to hear this. You've got to examine who's on your team because there's always one or two that don't belong because the enemy's mm-hmm. always going to find a way in, right? So he's going to always come in the, around the people that are most closest to you because that's the easiest access yeah. into you. So you have to look at your team and say, okay, who doesn't belong? Who doesn't? It doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means it's not the right fit, maybe, for what you're you're trying to do. Right? And then who does belong? Like, what pieces are you missing? You know, like, maybe you're you're a vision person, but you don't have the details covered. You need that kind of person, right? Or maybe you're details and you don't have the vision people. So whatever it is on your team, you need to figure out, like, who um, is not here and who is here that doesn't belong. Getting the right people on the bus and the wrong one off, that's half the battle you know, right also, there. Also, looking at your life, this is something that when I was leveling up my inner circle, my team, is what am I doing that's repelling good people? One right, of the first right. habits I found, I used to just talk crap. I did. I've just, mm-hmm. I, can, I can, I'm a visionary of a higher standard, which means I can find what's wrong with things. And I would just <laughs> be upset. And, and I found out the more successful people, I found out several, I mean, there's a several traits that successful and the kind of people I wanted to be around was they didn't have any time for any drama. And if Mm -hmm. you talk bad about someone, like what's wrong with you, how do you even have time to to think about these things? We've, most of us have heard the quote where it's, you know, great minds talk about ideas, average Mm -hmm. minds talk about about people and small minds talk about people. And so it's, do you want to be a great mind? So I literally printed that quote off and I put it in the big part of my vision board. I'm like, Oh yeah, don't forget. You're a great mind. You want to be a great mind. So if you want to keep great minds around you and you don't want to get voted off the Island or the circle, you have to have things worth talking about. And, and these people are always moving forward. That's why you want them in your friend circle. That's why you want them around you at all. So how can we be looking at things truthful enough to, to keep them in our life ourselves? One thing I had to learn always manage the expectations of others too. Mm. And that was a hard thing because sometimes I would expect things uh, for them to accomplish things or do things that maybe they weren't skilled in that, you know, that skill set. And maybe I had them in the wrong position and then they didn't live up to that. And then I would get like, oh, they don't belong here. But maybe I had them out of, wrong, you know, out of position or maybe my expectations of the situation were accurate or effective or empowering in a way that, you know, that I was seeing the situation. So that was the biggest thing. Cause I, you know, I, I have such a grind and a work ethic and a, just a tunnel vision. Like just when I, when I set a goal, it's like, that's it. That's all I talk about. That's all I do. It it's does have a grind. A no. Yeah. You know, and I expected everyone else to be that same way. And you know, everybody's got their own, own um, way of doing things. And if they, it didn't match mine, if it wasn't exactly the way mine was, I'd be like, Oh, they don't belong. And that, that's not necessarily the case because I, I missed a lot of talent that could have been on the team if I'd have just, you know, been able to see things a little differently than outside of me. Like, okay, this is my pattern, but I've got to look around and see other people and how they operate and what's most effective for them. And um, it took me a long time to figure, figure that aspect out, you know. 
another thing, when I came out of my old life, you know, I went from one world, one mindset and, you know, one lifestyle to this whole total opposite of that. So like there was this overlap area where I was all alone because like I had left that world, but I hadn't bumped into any new people yet in this new world that God was moving me towards. So I was kind of like in that overlap. There was no new people and all the old people didn't match where I was going. So I was quarantining myself from that, but I quarantined myself and now I'm alone. It's like, okay, Lord, I did, you know, I got away from the old lifestyle, but I'm here alone. You know, but that's exactly where at that moment in time, what I you know, thought was um, a negative was really, I was in the exact place I needed to be. Because this way God could put, you know, his voice in me and I, it wasn't, the noise wasn't there. You know, right yeah. now there's a lot of noise. You know, the world is noise, 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 noise. So maybe during this time right here is a great time that we get to actually reconnect and, you know, hear ourselves and hear the creator in us and hear the desires that we have on the inside, the visions, the goals, the dreams. We can hear them a little bit clearer right now. If we choose to, you know, if we, if we choose to turn the news off and say, okay, let's start over, fresh reset button, what do we want to do with our life, you know, and just start from scratch and start to really dig, dig down and, and find that truth on the inside of us and let it, let it speak. You know, most of the time we stay so busy, so grinding and so many tasks, you know, we never hear that voice, that truth has been trying to, you know, speak to us and sing to us and we won't listen to that music because we're too busy just staying busy. Mm. So this this time right now is a great time to listen to the music that's on the inside. Ooh, I like that. Listen to the music that's inside. So recenter, reconnect. That's right. Heal. Mm. And listen to God's truth for you. I mean, I'm listening. I'm saying, all right, what does this look like? What is the next step? Well, Where? there's a few things that people can do right now. You were asking about that, like during this time. Yes, you know, what, what can we do? Love the, it, love the, the, the first thing, step one in my book. This is great time, right? noise is gone we're in the house let's seek inside first the first step in my book is detox emotionally yes, getting yes, getting rid of the junk that's on the inside you always hear about people saying detox in the body from the stuff we're eating the poisons and all that but the most important thing to get out of your system is the bitterness the anger the resentment the unforgiveness the guilt all of this stuff the hidden is always the most dangerous right so step one in my book talks about um seeking inside there it is right there cleaning out the inside because our emotional state is what we live everything through we live everything in our life we live through our emotional state mm -hmm. right if so if we're bitter and we're angry and resentment everything that we see on the outside is going to come through that shelter so we can't see opportunity in that state we can't we're not prepared for success in that state the higher mm -hmm. you want to go the cleaner you must get that inside so that you know you can build the foundation on it. The inside, the emotional state is the foundation. And if it's shaky and rotten and corrupted and cracked or whatever, everything else that you build on top of that is going to be subject to, to collapse. So the, the reason I put that step one is I realized how important it was when I was going through the thing with my father. For one, there's three parts to it. For one, I was mad at God. Like, why did you take my dad? Why did you do this to me? What did he do? He, you know, I mean, I was just all the the, the angers and resentments and we're like, why do I have this panic attack now? Like my life was fine and you just do all of this and I'm blaming him for all of this stuff. Yeah. So I, I've got a lot of anger that I had to deal with. I had to forgive him first. Like I had to let it go. Um, number two, I had to forgive myself. If I had to move my daddy that day and like it's me that killed him and who am I to say I want success? You don't deserve that because you, you know, you killed your dad or whatever, you know, like the guilt. I was repelling opportunity repelling wow. um situations yeah, and i wouldn't look people in the i wouldn't look people in the eye because i didn't feel good about myself you know it's hard to connect it's hard to do business or anything else you won't look people in the eye like i just wouldn't do it because i was like they're gonna see me they're gonna see the pain the guilt so i just wouldn't look you know so i had to deal with that stuff and then the third thing is dealing with the past you know when people have wronged us betrayed us hurt us not met our expectations uh whatever you want to call it you know the things that we really haven't um, confronted and dealt with, you know, that we've been holding for years. You know, we, we stuff things down that happened to us for years and don't even realize it's down there. You know, it just keeps stacking them, stacking, stacking, and stacking. And for long, you've got a whole fence built around you on the inside and you can't even see out and you don't even know how you got there. Because it's one day at a time and one little thing that gets put in there, you don't really notice. But over years, you know, mm -hmm. it can become a disaster. You know, right. so the step here in, uh, in this book that I, that I suggest everybody do is sit down with a piece of paper, seek inside and ask yourself this question, who hurt me? Who wronged me? 
any kind of negative emotion. Who, you know, what am I feeling on the inside? Any negative type of emotion that you're feeling toward anybody, write that person's name down on a piece of paper. See, all the way back and just be, you know, alone with yourself, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and just let the voices begin to arise in you. Because these voices are there. We just don't listen to them or we shut them out or we become numb to them after so many years or whatever. Um, but really seek inside and say, what do I need to deal with? What have I not addressed? Who do I need to forgive? And you'll be surprised. Like when I would do this step, and I still do it every so often, I go back to the step because you don't want, you know, every day things are happening. So you might clean yourself out the day and a month later, you've had a hundred other things happen. You need to re-examine that too to make sure that stuff doesn't take root. But as, as I did it the first time, I went all the way back to like my um, third grade teacher saying some harmful things and hateful things and, you know, stuff that happened when I was a kid and different things that, that I had forgot all about, you know, being so busy, we don't even think about this stuff. But I've been holding resentments. I've been, and these things that happened back when I was in third grade were affecting decisions that I was making today. Wow. You know, somebody saying, you know, back then a teacher saying, oh, you're never going to be anything or you're just a troublemaker or whatever. Um, when I got out of high school, I was with this uh, one girl for five years and her mother couldn't stand me because at this point in time, I had nothing going on. I just had dreams. I wanted to be a rapper and that was it. But at that point in time, nothing was happening. It was just talk. So she used to say, oh, you're just dreaming. You're never going to be no good. You're going to be just like my my ex and da, 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 da. And she sold this over me. So like, the 17 years when I was in the music business, I, we ended up, me and her broke up like as right as the beginning. But for 17 years, I spent grinding and hustling in answer and response to what she said that I was never going to be anything. But it was really, you know, rooted in bitterness. It wasn't, you know, God used it in certain ways because I, you know, it helped me be successful in certain, a certain sense. But at the same time, it was rooted in bitterness and anger yeah, and the yeah, thing of the not, enemy. It's not right. something good. Right. So this step here, I want, I want anyone that's listening right now, make sure you do this step. Write down on, on paper who's ever hurt you, wronged you, whatever. Get it down on paper. And then what I want you to do is say a blessing, a prayer over every single one on that sheet. Because see, you had not truly forgiven someone until you can say a blessing and a prayer over that person. Right. Now, here's what I want to clear up too. When I say this, I'm not saying that what was done to us or whoever's listening done to you was right. I'm not agreeing with that. What I'm saying is your future is too important to be held hostage by what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. Right. So we got to let that stuff go. Cause see forgiveness is dialysis for the soul. Get mm -hmm. it out, get it out, get it out. See unforgiveness is self incarceration. We put ourselves in prison, an emotional prison. Right. But the good thing about it is we hold the key. Mm. We hold the keys and we can get out whenever we want to say we get out. We can sentence ourselves to two days or 25 years. It's up to us. And what I'm saying and challenge each and every one of you today is take the keys and free yourself. Say the blessing over these people. Say it for the next seven days. Every night before you go to bed, put your hand on a piece of paper. Say, I forgive you. May Ooh. God bless you, your family. May you be prosperous, anointed, and all good come to you. And by doing this for a few days, mm. you'll begin to see the change on the inside. and You'll begin to come lighter. You'll be, got, you know, you'll start to return to wholeness, you know? I've got a personal testimony and I don't want to, I don't want to jack what you just told everybody to do, but I have to say this story. So I'm reading this book, Blessed and Unstoppable, chapter one. And then there's this exercise at the end, write out everybody's name and then pray a blessing over them. And I'm not right. going to lie. My initial reaction was anger. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm not I do not want to do that. Blah, blah, blah. No way. And then I was like, mm -hmm. I have to. And then I was like, no, I don't want to. Have to. Mm -hmm. So God's only spoken to me audibly a few times in my life. This was one of them. God interrupts my thoughts and he goes, write down everybody who's ever hurt you and write down what they did. And so I kind of got excited about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they did this. And it may even be, he's like, even people that you still love, like a sister or something like that, mm -hmm. that has hurt you, but you know, you still like them. You're still in your life. So I wrote them all down, every hurt. And I was like, look at all these jerks. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, so before I could even get emotionally to the blessing, it was so interesting, but right? he added to your exercise. He said, now write down everything you wouldn't have 
had I spared them from ever entering your life? Hmm. Amen. And I woke up. That healed me from, then I can pray, pray a blessing because I recognized that the worst people in my life gave me the greatest blessings. And Amen. I, I wouldn't be here, or the people, not even the worst, just the people who have hurt me the most. Because you, you said it earlier, Satan can go through the people closest to you, and that's freaking happened a lot to me. But the greatest yeah. blessings of my life today have come from the people who have hurt me the worst. And truly, I really, I really do mean this. And it's been the great, that, has, that exercise shifted my being forever. So thank you for writing that. Oh, God is good. So I, he worked on me a different way. He worked on me like he went that way with you with me because I had a little little issue like you did too. Like, you know, how am I going to say the, the blessing over these people? <laughs> he moved on my spirit and said, now I want you in another call and you write down everything you've done wrong to anyone oh, else. Oh, yeah. So then it put in perspective, oh, like, yeah. well, you know, look at all the you've done over here. <laughs> Yeah, he kind of confronted me. I needed, wow. I needed a little smack in the face, right? So he was like, you know, you remember that time? And you remember this other time? And you thought nobody was looking? And you remember that? And this? Yeah. And so, like, it was a long, it was a lot longer list on that other side of things. And then it kind of brought into perspective. Like, okay. Wow. And then I got what he was saying, too, because, like, he, he was basically saying, look, I forgave, you know, oh, yeah. this side. You can't give, forgive that little list on the other side. So um, it kind of brought into his, you know, perspective. But th this step is... Um, been tremendous. I've got more feedback on step one in that book. Oh. I mean, from prisons, they're using this in prison programs, addiction programs, oh. uh, even high schools now, they've been been doing some of the steps in this um, with, with this book and it's just been amazing. But anybody, if you have the opportunity to get this book and do chapter it's one, not just it will on change it. It is so your good. life. It is so good. It mm. is so good. Where, where, where can we buy yeah. this book? Uh, blessedunstoppable.com. Bless, it's real Amazon. simple. Bless and <laughs> we're going, yeah, we're going straight. We had an issue with that. Right, right. <laughs> okay, what's step two? What's step two? You said you got three things for us before we wrap up this call. Okay. What are your three? Well, actually, I'll give, you, I'll give you four. But number two is decide the legacy. Decide the legacy right now. What do you want to be remembered okay. for? When you're gone and when it's over, what is, what's going to be on the headstone? What's going to be on the obituary? And I read this uh story about this famous famous author and you know every book he wrote was a bestseller everyone and, and they sat down with him like how do you do this what's your writing process like how does every book you know just come out like a masterpiece every single one you do and he said well i have a simple simple process he said the first thing i do is i write the last chapter first hmm. then i always know where i'm going it makes it you know makes it real easy as the story goes because i always know where i'm going to end up so we need to write our last hmm. chapter First. And our last chapter is that 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 headstone and the obituary. Now we don't necessarily need to know how we're going to get there at this stage. Right. We just need to know the outcomes and the legacy that we want to you live. Let me say, you know. So like, start yeah, start with that because if you get you can do everything else right, but if you get this part wrong, it really doesn't matter, right? If if at the end of the day when you when you die, if you're not leaving the legacy you want, then what did we really do here, right? So if we didn't leave the world better than we found it, we wasted. We wasted the opportunity, you know. So start with the end of mind first and figure out what's really important. What kind of words do you want people to describe you? If they say, okay, um, Brittany, if, if you're going to say, what three words would you want them to say when, when they spoke about you? We, we need to decide these things. That way when we're getting up every single day, we know what it is that we're working to. We have clarity. And clarity is potential mm -hmm. power. It's consolidation. And it puts us in a place that we can actually be useful. You know, a person that doesn't, doesn't have... Um, Clarity is walking around the state of chaos, mm. you know? So we get, that's right. So what we do is we get, we get the legacy in focus. And then we work, the next step is vision. We got to have a vision for our life. You don't want to get up and just be in a state of randomness, like life happening to us. It's, we're supposed to happen to life the other way around. You know, as believers, um, we're not just supposed to have everything happen. We're supposed to be on the attack, you know, living life to the edge and pushing on it instead of it pressing on us, you know? And um, those with a vision have so much more um, magnetic qualities that draw and attract opportunities. Yeah. You know, we, we don't really 
if we don't know what we want, we don't really know how to get what we're getting, what we're living for. Like, what are we here for? So, I mean, this is biblical too. Yeah. It's biblical, but it's also science. So it doesn't even matter right. what you believe. This is truth. Right. It's truth that is truth. I mean, if you look at anybody that's changed the world, they did it first with a vision. It started with, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said, I want to connect the world. You know, now we have Facebook. Um, Steve Jobs says, I want to change technology. You know, I want to make, you know, the, the, the iPod or whatever. I want to put all the music in your pocket, whatever it was. They had vision. Elon Musk saying, I want to go to Mars. Like, they, he knows every day he's getting up. We're going to Mars. We're going to Mars. JFK said, we're going to the moon by the end of the decade. Right? Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. Right? The people that changed the world, it started here. Where there was no vision, the people perished. Right? So yeah. we got to start right here. Mm -hmm. And what we got to do is, it's not just enough to dream in here. You know, we got to get it down on paper. Mm. I, I know this one guy who um, 15, 20 years ago, he started writing down his goals, his vision in the morning when he got up, writing it down before he went to bed. He'd write it and read it aloud, go through the day. And then before he went to bed, he'd write it again, read it aloud and go to sleep. He did this every single day. That guy's worth $100 million now. So there's actual strength. Because these are principles, by, you know, that actually govern success that we cannot get away from, you know. And um, I think it was, I think it was Tony Robbins said, the, the person that walks in the room that's most clear, has the most clarity in the vision, commands the room. Doesn't matter who's there, but if you know what you're there for and you know why you're here on this earth, that's half the battle. That's 90% of the battle right there, if you know what it is you want. You know, because how can life give you what it is you want if you don't know what you want? Well, if you even want to just look at it from like a, science or humanity mm -hmm. perspective is human brains are made to keep you alive not to mm -hmm. make you successful or right. anything like that. it's just to make you survive and they also like the path of least resistance mm -hmm. so they like to follow something that seems safe and so if you have clarity and vision then you have it a little more organized than people who haven't taken the time to mm -hmm. design their destiny to figure right. out what really matters. And so you'll literally attract people who are looking for something to follow just for taking the time to get clear. That's right. See, personal transformation starts here first. Mm -hmm. This is where all the change begins. Our future comes directly off the assembly line of our mind, one thought mm -hmm. at a time. Our mind is the factory. What are you building? What is your product? What are you constructing? Right? And if we have to dream the dream. Dream the dream. What is what dream is on the inside of you? You know, dream the dream and dream that dream in 4K, high definition, high resolution mental imagery. See that thing, smell that thing, taste that thing, touch that thing. Make it so big in your mind that it has no place to go except into the physical. Woo. Right? We make it so big here that we can grab it like one handlebars and just yoke it into the now, into, into the to reality. We want to close our eyes and dream and plant ourselves in that new desired outcome. We want to pack the U-Haul up, move where we're at mentally and emotionally and everything that we know, we want to pack that up on the inside, move to that new lot, that new home, that dream, that destiny, right? We want to plant our feet there, unpack that U-Haul truck and never go back. So when we open our eyes up, we don't see where we're at now. We still continue to live in that new dream until that dream manifests. And that's the only thing we see. You know, here you always with the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. You got to have that one vision when you get up and just move. And be consolidated and, and unified and focused on that one thing and not get distracted by the virus or anything else that life is trying to pull us off. Right? Because broken focus is the number one reason for failure. Woo, so if you can wow. if you can keep your mind and your focus on one thing and one thing over and over and over, you can give birth to it. You can bring it into existence. But if you give a little bit over here attention, a little bit over there, and you start diluting and polluting your thinking then you become less and less empowered, less and less um, able to accomplish that which, you know, that you have set out to do. So we have to get that one dream that's so inspiring that that's all you want to do and that's all you want to think about and that's all that you want to put your energy to. Get up every single day and do that and you'll be successful. Mm -hmm. And even if your path starts to shift, in my experience, I thought I, you know, I knew the direction, mm -hmm. serving right. people, serving God. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it at a big level and I want to, I want the result to be helping to end human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So this is the direction, but it's like, you're going along, going on virus, psh, you know, mm -hmm. right, right, right. You have to be dedicated enough to be willing to be recalculating. Like the, mm -hmm. when, the, when the road drops off, just find another way, but be relentless. 
Right. Same thing another way. Hey, yep, 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 yep. you know, you're just kind of mm-hmm. firing around. Like you, you will find it. But I don't even believed in closed doors. I just believed in shifted roads. Like the path you thought, which you don't have the full picture anyway. Right, right. You never have the full picture, but the path you thought isn't going to be the path. Don't be dismayed. It's going to be a greater story. You know, your story, you have the authority to speak into everybody's life who's dealing with anxiety, who's dealing with panic attacks, who's feeling stuck at home, who feels like they have no friends, who's recalculating their entire life right now. Right. And you can, you have that authority, but you don't even know why God allowed the shift to happen. Again, we, I, I'm, I don't like when people just sit around. It's like, go for it. Right, right. But trust that you're guided. Right. Trust that you're guided and don't be mad at it. That's my hardest thing is not getting lost in the frustration of the plan change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's hard on that. But it's understanding in the fullness of time, I'll understand why the path shifted, but the, direct, the direction and the goal never changed. Right. Like you start with the legacy and it's broad. Like mine is um, mm-hmm. to set the world on fire with truth, right? To impact one billion people, right? That's the outcome and it's broad. Um, that's where I started. And I didn't know how I was going to do that. Like right. I wasn't speaking in, I wasn't writing books, any of that. So I had to start broad. And then I had to trust that, okay, God will show me how to do this. He'll begin to awaken me and reveal to me the path to go about reaching that outcome. So the way we have to approach this thing is that the legacy, the outcome is non-negotiable, right? The strategy and the way we get there, we must be flexible. Because we learn more about ourselves every day. When we dream the original dream, like when I when I said, okay, I want to impact people, and, I, and this is what I want on my my headstone, I wasn't necessarily the same person I am today. Because now I've got a lot more knowledge of who I am, and God has revealed things. So we have to be flexible. You know, I had to be like, okay, if I thought it was because back then I thought it was rapping, like I was going to go back into rap, but I was going to do this. It wasn't really the case. I was God was about to do a new thing, so I had to be flexible. Like, okay, if that's not what you want, I'm open to whatever it is you want me to do. So first it was to write the book. Then he brought me back to YouTube where I started doing these messages. Now it's going out live and doing these events and touching people one-on-one, the clothing lines and all these other things that are going to provide the resources to impact that one billion. But right. the, one, the one billion has never changed, never wavered. The strategy about how I'm going to do that, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Zoom like this, Facebook, so that could all change. We can, we can, you know, that's flexible. But the one billion, that's not flexible. That's going to happen. That I'm unified and I'm not conceding, I'm not negotiating, I'm not going to do 999 million. No, I'm doing 1 billion. That is non negotiable, <laughs> right? Now we can upscale that, but we'll never downscale it and we'll never negotiate it. So you start out with outcome, your legacy first, then the outcomes that will produce that legacy, then the goals, and then the actions that it's going to take to make those goals a reality. So that's the step right there. And during this time, you want to bring your life in focus. Since we got this downtime, two weeks, a month, whatever it is time that we've got. When you come out of this, this uh, season right here, we want to have a blueprint. We want to know why we're here, what we're here to do, what we're passionate about, what we're on fire you know, for, what we're committed to. You know, that's the question. What are we really committed to giving our life to? Like everything that we have, what are we willing to commit to? Mm-hmm. And that's the one thing that, you know, most people never stop and ask the question. They just go through the motions all day long and say, really, am I giving my life and my time and my energy, my, mo- my most precious asset? Am I really giving it to something that is worth giving it to? Right. Your only non-renewable resource. that could. Yeah, you cannot get time back. You, cannot, you, know, you can get time extended for our restore the lost years that the canker were made, which God revealed to me. I lost seven years, but he, will, he can extend that out in, in other ways. But we can't get, I can't get those seven years back when I was going through the struggle. Like, that's gone. So, like, you know, every second is, is something we're not getting back. So we need to make, you know, the most of it and make sure we're giving that most precious resource to something that's actually worth it. You know, mm-hmm. giving it toward that watch that I was chasing, like, they got a new watch now. That watch ain't even cool no more, right? But I was right. so concerned with that. Like, that meant everything to have the new rim or the new model car or whatever, or this neighborhood, and that neighborhood's not even hot anymore. Now it's another neighborhood, right? So, like, no matter what we do, we got to make sure whatever it is we're sowing our life into, we're chasing is really worth it. You know, yeah. it's something longevity. You know, not just something, not a trend, not a fad, but some truth that's going to continue to live on to us, you know? And then the last you, step. Let's go to the last step. Would yeah. you want to ask the person when I ask them? I say, I think, I think one of the biggest reasons we're here on this earth journey 
is, did you learn to love? Amen. And did you show it? That's did right. you show it in your act? You, you don't want to, ch- you know, empower a billion people because you want to be some really cool, high and mighty no. speaker. No. You, you want to empower a billion people because that's your expression of love. Right. So what is, right. what is the way in which you love people in your work? What's the way in right. which you can love people in your voice and your actions? And, right. and you know, what I, one, one thing I want to add to what you just said is if you can, you know, write the story. This, it's so crazy that this is the thing you do too, because this is the thing I like coach on and it's the thing that shifted my life. But if you can also summarize it into one statement, the right. purpose of my life is to, and it's mm-hmm. best with one word. And so for me, the purpose of my life is to serve. So I've got right. the story. I need the story. This is like the mm-hmm. direct deliver and I update it every year. But I also like the summary because then I can, you know, if I'm not saving a child from sex trafficking today, I don't, I don't feel purposeless. I felt my purpose in serving the world by making this video with you, which I so enjoyed. Thank you for your time. And I, I can serve by bringing somebody to water or cleaning up a road or helping a little animal, whatever it is. Like, how can you, right. if it's, is it to love? Is it to serve? Is it to empower? Is it to inspire? Mm-hmm. What is your thing? And that, that quick and dirty is a good all day reminder to feel the high of in, in feeling your purpose. That's been really- I, I, I teach this, this three step thing is, is called fire truth music, right? It's, it's three things that I filter things through. And I, I teach others to do this step. Um, the first step is fire. Okay. That's what are you most passionate about in life? The thing that sets you on fire on the inside. It's not about money. And not about fame or any of the other stuff. What just like if the money was out of the equation, um, success and accolades and all that was out, and it was just the thing. What is the thing that you would do all day long that you just love that you just set you on fire? And that's where we need to start because that's what God has called us to do. Mm. Um, a wise man told me one time, whatever makes you angry or brings you to tears, that's the clue to your calling. That's what you're here, you know, Ooh. to solve that all that thing. So like what sets us on fire and when we begin to tap into that fire, we're closer to God. We're closer to God because that's what we've been called to do. And when we start to do what he really designed us to do, we light up. We become more powerful. We start to vibrate at a higher level. Success Mm -hmm. and effectiveness and empowerment, all that is a frequency, right? Mm -hmm. Now when we're doing what we were designed to do, we vibrate instantly at a higher level than we would if we were doing something that we weren't, you know, happy to do or excited about doing. Excitement, that, that enthusiasm, it's the same thing with everything. Relationships, you want to be with the one that sets you on fire on the inside. If you do not feel like I cannot breathe without being in the presence of this person, you need to re-examine that, right? Same thing with the spiritual call. You, wanna, you don't want a lukewarm relationship with God, your creator, whatever it is. You want that thing to be on fire, real, true. Not, you know, not just going through the motions and religion, as they call it. That, no, but what no. sets you on fire with that? And you want to bring fire into everything, your body, your health, the food you eat, <laughs> the things you, everything that you do should be wrapped in that fire, right? The second thing is truth, okay? There's God's truth that he's here, and then our truth, what he has made us to do. Our likes, our interests, our personalities. We have to keep it, right? We have to be who we were designed to be. We can't ever succeed at the highest level by being something that we're not. Mm-hmm. You know, we have to be our authentic self. And when, when I was doing rap for all those years, I was living half truths. You know, like half of me is in this and half of this is with a fictitious character or something I'm trying to portray or whatever. It really wasn't, you know, 120% Billy. Right. So when, when I got out of that life this time around, like this time I'm going to do me. Like for once in my life, I'm going to do Billy. If the world doesn't like it, then they just don't like it. But the only person I can truly be is me. Mm. And the only person that I'm going to be the best at being is me. So like I, if uh, per, any person that's them, their own true identity has a heads up on anyone else because most people just are not living in that, that depth of truth. So it's fire and truth. And then the last thing is music. And what I mean by music, I don't mean acoustic music, but music is the vibration of us taking the first two, the fire and our truth and wrapping it in some form of value that we can give to the world, our music. Right, whether it's like mine is it's the YouTube videos, the books, the poetry, the the live, whatever, whatever it is, or you know, real estate or creating architecture, whatever it is, whatever you do, it's creating that music and giving that music to the world. It's it's our gift of creativity. So it's wrapping these fire truth of music. That's a whole philosophy in itself. 
But if we master these three things right here with so much, you know, and, and a more um, higher level of existence. Yeah. I could talk to you for hours. We got to get back to the four things though. So I think we're on step three and I want you to okay. go back to them real quick. Just yes. what, are the, what are the three we covered and what's the last one? I'm still dangling, wondering what that one we, is. Okay. We, we, got detox, we, got, we got detox to get ourselves right Talks? to start out. We got legacy. Legacy. What's this whole thing about? What is life about? And number three is what's the vision that we want to you know, have for our life? What does it look like? And then the fourth thing here is during this season right now, is education, what we're pouring into ourselves right now. We don't want to pour in doom and gloom all day long. Like what I've been doing since I've had this downtime is going back and reading biographies on great men and women who've done amazing things, who've started revolutions and changed the world and disrupted things and came in with new ideas. I've been reading as much as I can. I've been doing two, three hours, four hours every single day studying the lives of the greats. If you want to be great. Yeah, I've been doing two you hours. To, you just pour, hours pour, that's right. That's right. Now we want to pour, we want to pour the audio messages in, the books, the inspiration. We want to watch movies that inspire us, music that inspires us, books that inspire us. It's very, very important right now to guard the gates of the mind and make yeah. sure what you're pouring in is something that's going to empower you. So when this thing is all over, you're coming out of this situation and out of this season stronger and more consolidated than ever. And that's the key right now. I think these, these things we're all able to do at this point because they don't, um, rely on the world when that day opens up that everybody's back online and we can get back to work or whatever. This is stuff we can do at home that, that you know, that's not determined by anyone else. We control our own detox, whether we let go. We control our own legacy and our mm -hmm. vision and then what we're pouring in. We control these things. So, and part of this step right here is too is getting back to basics in whatever field it is you're doing, whatever um, field of expertise, relationships, spiritual relationships, get back to basics. My dad used to say, when you get lost in life, Go back to basics. So mm -hmm. if it's real estate, you're in, what's the keys to real estate? You know, customer service or marketing or whatever, get back to basics. Mm -hmm. If it's writing, get back to basics. You know, if it's a relationship, connection, maybe, maybe in this world we've, we've been scattered and not been able to connect with our significant others and now we got this yeah. moment, let's get back to the relationship basics. Reconnect, right? So whatever it is, see, look, look at your life right now and say what needs to be adjusted, modified, mm -hmm. improved upon, and let's do that now in this downtime. Love it. Oh my gosh. Oh, so good. So good. I am so happy. God is good. I had the opportunity to interview you. You crushed it. Amazing. Thank you. Any parting words you want to say as we wrap up here? Any, 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 what's, what's the best advice you could possibly dream, give? It? Dream big for with God, all things are possible. Most of us out here are dreaming way too small way too small. God has got so much more for us. We can go to the edge of this globe if we would just trust him. So mm. dream big. Don't, don't keep yourself in a box in that 15 mile box that most people live in that local needs. Dream big global needs, right? And know that with God, all things are possible. You don't have to have it all figured out right now. Just take it one day at a time, dream big and then own the day. Dream big and own the day. You have traveled all over the world. You are a motivational speaker because you understand great truth and you're lighting people on fire. And I've seen you on your way to empowering a billion people. How can people be a force for good during the greatest time of fear that most of us have, have seen in our lifetimes? Well, one thing um, I learned from, from my mother as I was going through my panic attacks, you know, I would call her during the dark moments when these panic attacks would come on, I'd call her and she'd kind of hold my hand over the phone to, to help me get through this terror. But um, she started doing this thing and oh, it just annoyed me at the time because I wanted my little place to, you know, come and pout or whatever you want to call it. But um, she's not for that. She wasn't, you know, wasn't for the pout. And there's a time to pout and grieve, but then it's time like some you got to get up and do what you've been called to do. So I would start calling her with these panic attacks and, and she'd say, Billy, like, cause I'd be telling him as soon as I called, I'd be like, all the stuff negative that was happening. No, I'm this, I'm that, da, da, da. my money's bad, and I'm about to have, you know, die. And uh, she'd get my attention. She'd yell. She'd say, Billy, to, you know, kind of shocked me to get my attention. And she'd say, Who have you helped today? And I'd mm. be like, I'd be like, Mom, I'm about to go to the hospital, you know, or whatever. I'm about to die, mm -hmm. and or my whole life is gone. And you're asking me, Who have I helped today? 
She's like, yes, who are you today? And I was like, no one. I've been. She said, well, call me back when you've helped somebody. And she'd hang the phone up. And I would be like, <laughs> I mean, wow. and she meant it. She meant it like, do not call her back until I could say I helped somebody. Now, I didn't have to do anything big. It wasn't like it was like the size of the help. But I, I would have to say that I did this or that for someone. And then she would talk to me. So like, I would have to go to Walmart or something and give a dollar to a guy on the corner or jump, you know, like somebody, maybe their battery was dead and needed to jump off or something and I help them with that or somebody, you know, pray for somebody or something. I'd have to do something and I have to answer for that. So I'd get to the point when I'd call her back and I'd say, don't hang up. I helped somebody. And then she'd say, okay, tell uh -huh. me no. And then, then she would listen to my problems. So um, maybe some, some of us out there right now, you know, going through tough times and struggles with business and all this chaos if we just put our mind in the right place and say who have we helped today or who can we help today let's start with that question even if it's just something small like sending somebody you know a message on social media hey i'm praying for you or you know hey is there anything i can do let me know i, I got you or whatever uh, i'm thinking about you sometimes just that like when i was going through mm -hmm. the panic attacks nobody was texting me or calling me or any of that kind of stuff and i felt so alone and mm -hmm. sometimes um, I'd be out somewhere and God would send somebody just out of the blue. Somebody didn't even know me and say like, you know, God told me to pray for you. And it wow. meant like everything because, you know, you're thinking like nobody cares, nobody cares. And then somebody out of the blue would just drop that little bit of, of love in there. And it would just change everything. I'm like, oh God, you know, somebody actually cared. And it means so much, you know, it didn't, it didn't have to be money. It didn't have to mean just to know when somebody actually, you know, cared about me in that moment, man, everything. So in this dark time, with so many people being isolated, not able to do the thing, depression and doom and gloom, um, we, we need to be more aware of that and just continue to ask that question. How can I be of value? How can I help others? How can I sow life into others? What can I do? What do people need? And find a way, because there's plenty of opportunity to help people out there right now. We just got to start with the, the right mindset. And as I mentioned earlier, questions will take us where we want to go. We just mm. got to ask the right question. So the question is, how can I be of use? You know, we ask God, use me today. How can I help you today? Put me in position to be useful for your purposes. And he will. He'll, I ask that all the time. And he'll sit me right wow. next to a person on a plane that I needed to sit next to. You know, wow. like I was, going, I was going to D.C. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this virus thing was just beginning to really scare people. And the plane was like, you know, one-fifth full. But God sat me right next to the person I needed to talk to. You know, and, and most people wanted me to cancel that event in D.C. They were like, oh, you know, the virus. And I was like, no, God, you know, God is good. He's got us. He'll protect us. We, we don't back from that. So I went on. And, and by doing so, God put me right next to a person that I need to speak to. Her son was um, struggling with drugs, you know, this addiction thing. Wow. And we set up her right there on the, on the plane. I sent her a copy of the book. He's been working the program. So, like, this is what happens every single day if we, if we allow him to work through us. So just, just ask, you know, how can I be of use? Put me in the right position at the right time. Let me have the right words for that person, whoever it is. You know, it could be something small. It doesn't have to be a, you know, we always think helping people means big amounts of money or something big. But most of the time, it's just something small. If people just know they're careful, that means everything, you know? So keep that mindset in this, this type of environment. Powerful, powerful. Well, I bless you and all that you are doing, sir. And I am grateful that you're going to be in our group. I'm so excited to be hearing from you, the encouragement and inspiration and all the opportunities that you're seeing. And I'm thank so you. grateful again. Thank you for your time. Keep up the great work. You are truly blessed and unstoppable. I appreciate it. I got to end this like I end all my messages, okay? Do it. I'm Dr. Billy Allsbrooks blessed and unstoppable and to god be the glory thank you for having me on Brittany.